Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. I've never felt more liberty to preach what was on my heart. Never have I felt the door swung open so widely to preach apostolic Pentecostal concepts and truths that I feel in my heart. Now I'm reading many portions of scripture. And so there won't be any use for you to turn with me. You just believe me while I read tonight. The ninth chapter, the tenth chapter of the book of Matthew, verse 7 and 8. As ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. And I want to stop here and make this statement. You got it free. You got it free. Amen. Let's all say, I got it free. Everybody say it. I got it free. Jesus paid it all. That's a sweet old song, isn't it? Amen. There's nothing you have to do but just believe God and be obedient to the scripture. As far as the price being paid, Calvary paid it all. Freely you have received, freely give. In this scripture we find in content, tremendous miraculous power is given by Jesus Christ to his apostles. They are commanded to go out and preach. They are not told just to go preach sermons. They are told to demonstrate the power they have received. Freely ye have received, freely give. Now I dare to say tonight that a few years ago this scripture would have been a little more dense for us to uh, spirit, spiritually digest than it is tonight because we feel spiritual atmospheres in our churches tonight that we didn't feel a year ago or two years ago. There is no question about this fact that we are experiencing a great revival. I want to say that again because there's some folks don't believe it. We are experiencing a great revival. Revival, first of all, is not necessarily bringing in the lost. Revival is reviving that which has once lived and has died. And we are seeing a revival in our churches. Our pastors are preaching like they've been set afire. Never have we heard so much about the glory and the power and the miraculous as we have in the last few months. We've never been so bold as to speak openly about the gifts and the operation of the Spirit of God as we have in the last couple of years. Something's happening to our spiritual minds. We are accepting things we didn't accept before. We are understanding things we didn't understand before. Now it has been called and named. This move has been named by our movement. You can call it what you like, and if you don't call it anything, it's not going to change it. We've called it end time revival. We've called it end time revival. That's what we've called it. Now, I want to know how many campers in here believe that we are experiencing an end time revival. I'd like to see your hands. You really believe that? Would you wave your hand just a little? Now, it's been preached to us. It can be one of two things, and I intend to tear this all apart tonight and look it over, all right? It can be one of two things. It either is an end time moving of the Spirit of God as we have never seen before, or else we have gotten our minds and our hearts in an atmosphere and a place that we haven't been for years, and we're seeing more of the miraculous, more of the spiritual, and definitely more of the supernatural than we have ever, ever witnessed before in our lifetime. I remember as a boy, I was reared in a great Christian home, and my dad is an old-fashioned preacher. He's an old conservative-lined preacher, and I remember him preaching, but never in all of my experience in being under my father have I ever seen, and I asked my father, and he tells me that he has never seen, even in the early days of Pentecost, the excitement, the power, and the operation of the Holy Ghost with wisdom as we are seeing it now. Amen. I think we ought to say hallelujah. Everybody say praise the Lord. 
If I don't establish that with you, anything I preach tonight will be null and void. It'll be absolutely of no value. We are in a spiritual time. Our leaders have told us on this platform, we don't want this to be just an average youth camp. Now, we're not running competition with Louisiana, and we're not running competition with Missouri, and we're not running competition with Indiana for numbers. We've done that long enough. We're not running competition with anybody to see how many we can get prayed through. What we want now more than anything else is an apostolic Holy Ghost revival. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I haven't gotten to my text tonight. I'm going to the Old Testament a while. Listen to this now. This is from Leviticus. And if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take thou no usury of him or increase, but fear thy God that thy brother may live with thee. Amen. I know you don't understand what I'm reading. You just hang in there. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. My text tonight is this. Listen carefully. Spiritual usury. That's my text spiritual usury. We know that everything done in the Old Testament to Israel was done for our example. The Bible says so in the New Testament. We are the people that God did all of that for. They acted all of that out in the flesh so we could understand it in the spirit. God gave a command in the flesh to physical Israel and said, you can't charge your brother any interest on your money. If you loan him something, you can't take any extra from him for him using your money. You can't charge him for the food you feed him. You got to give it to him. And the reason you've got to give it to him is because you're in Canaan land. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. You didn't buy it. You didn't dig the wells in it. You didn't build the cities in it. You got it free. Somebody gave it to you. You didn't pay anything to get it. You weren't born into it. You just got it because I said I'd give it to you and I wanted to be your God. I gave it to you free. You remember in Deuteronomy, it says in the sixth chapter, when you have come into a land that you did not fight for and you live in houses that you didn't build and you drink from wells you didn't dig and you eat from vineyards you didn't plant, then after you have eaten and are full, beware lest you forget the Lord your God which brought you up out of the land of Egypt and gave you Canaan for an inheritance. Freely ye have received, freely give. I want to stop here long enough to tell you that there's nothing more beautiful than the free apostolic message we have received. You can pop down anywhere on your knees. Some people have received the Holy Ghost in old time Pentecost on buses and streetcars, in trains. They get it outside in brush arbors. Lots of you folks have gotten it right here under this old outdoor tabernacle. You've received it at all at home, in your home church. You've got it in a living room or in a bedroom or somewhere driving an automobile. I've heard of instances where people receive the Holy Ghost just anywhere. You've got it free. You don't have to pay a down payment for it. You don't have to give your children away for it. You don't have to give away anything you've got except your sin. And you don't lose anything for giving that away. Sin doesn't cost you anything. Amen. Giving that away doesn't cost you. It pays to get rid of your sin. So you got it free. Now God told his physical people, Israel, when you get in that land, you don't charge your brother. Don't you charge him a dime. If you've got food on your table, you let him sit down and eat with you. If you've got a little money in the bank, you give him a little something to help him and let him stay in your house. But don't charge him usury. The word usury for our good tonight is interest or taking that above what is actually the cost and putting it in your own pocket. God hated that worse than he did idolatry. 
That made God so mad. I want to tell you, God got mad at them when they did that. In Ezekiel, he said, you have exacted usury, every man of his brother. He said, that's not all, but you've shed the innocent blood. And you've oppressed the strangers wrongfully. And I'll tell you what I've done. God says, I look for one man to stand in the gap and make up the hedge for Israel. And I couldn't find one honest man. Nobody. Everybody was taking advantage of his brother. Everybody was taking his brother's goods. You say, I don't understand how this all matches up. I'll tell you just exactly how it all matches up. This is how. Nehemiah was a cupbearer before the king. He came before the king one day and his countenance was fallen. The king liked him. He'd been there lots of years. And he noticed the change, the physical change, in Nehemiah's expression. How many of you are listening to me preach now? Say amen. That's not good enough. How many of you are listening to me preach? Say amen. Now you listen carefully. I'm going to preach you something tonight. I'm going to put some fat on your bones. We shouted here last night. You can listen to me preach tonight. Amen. Come on. Amen. You know what we like? We like to shout, and I'm all for shouting, and you're going to find out I'm going to spiritually cuss tonight. Everybody that don't love it, if you'll excuse my poor expression. I don't like folks to sit around and criticize while somebody else is getting blessed. But I want to tell you what we like. We love to get a blessing. And we like to get blessed more than we like to hear preaching. We can leap over benches and stay till midnight to shout. It's hard for us to listen to the preacher preach. I'm fixing to do it till I get tired. Amen. <laughs> Nehemiah said, I'm sad in my heart. And this is why. Because I didn't come from this country. I am from Israel, Jerusalem. And it is laid waste. And it was. It was a terrible thing. Seventy years before this time, Nebuchadnezzar had come in. The armies of Babylon had come in. God had judged Israel for her sin and her ungodliness and for her usury and for her idolatry. God hated that business. And do you know that 19 kingdoms in Israel after Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and those were the kings right after Solomon, and Solomon was right after David, and David was right after Saul, you know. 19 dynasties in both the north and southern kingdom followed after idolatry. Jeroboam was anointed by Ahijah the Shilonite. He stood on the road. The Lord spoke to the prophet Ahijah and said, Go anoint Jeroboam. I'm going to make him king over Israel. I'm going to give him ten whole tribes. And so he marched out there and God said, Take your garments up. And so he tore it up in ten pieces and said, Here you are, Jeroboam. God's going to give Israel to you, all ten of these tribes. And he poured oil on his head and he said, God's anointed you to be king. All you've got to do is let Israel go down and worship in Jerusalem like God told her to. Let her love God. Let her go down there and do the will of God. That's all you've got to do. And if you do that, Jeroboam, God's going to build you a house like he built for David. Nobody's going to overcome you. Nobody's going to take advantage of you. You're going to be the king in Israel. Nobody can move you. But you know what happened? That reprobate got to thinking about that. And down in his heart, he got to thinking against God. He reasoned against that. And here's what he said. If I let these people go worship God in Jerusalem, they'll turn back again to Rehoboam their king and they'll kill me. So he went up to Dan and down to Beersheba to the extremities of his country where he was king. And he set up two big old golden calves. And then he said, Behold, Israel, the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And God didn't like that. Because he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. And you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I am a jealous God and I won't have it. And they did it for dynasty after dynasty. That means the changing of kings. One king after another, king after another, until God got sick of it. He couldn't take it anymore. And so he let Nebuchadnezzar come and take him away. And that's how Nehemiah got way down there in Babylon. And they were there for 70 years. While Nebuchadnezzar had left Jerusalem a shambles. Everything was torn down. The walls were crumbled down. The buildings were torn down. That beautiful first house that was built to the Lord by Solomon was torn down. The first house was torn down. Some of the greatest preaching I've heard on end time revival has been from some of these texts of scriptures where I've heard some mighty men of God in the last few months and last few years preach. And I could name some of them and you would respect their names, but I will not take that time tonight. I heard one of them preach, the latter house shall be greater than the former. And he preached about them coming back and rebuilding again, laying again the foundation. 
Hallelujah. We build on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. We know what the foundation is, don't we? We know what the foundation doctrine is and gospel is. And then they rebuild again that beautiful temple. What a wonderful thing. And the Bible said they shouted until the earth shook when the foundations of the house of the Lord was laid again. We believe that we are the people upon whom the ends of the world are come. Joel said, I will give you back the years that the caterpillar hath eaten, the years that the canker worm hath eaten, and all of these things that I sent upon you. I'm going to give you back all those years, all those dark ages, when the gospel was preached only just a little bit, when the light of this doctrine was almost snuffed out by Catholicism. I'm going to give you back those, if we believe it in type. I'm going to give you back all of that and heap it on you. I'm going to do a quick work. I'm going to take you out of here. We feel the rushing. It's like pouring fluid into a bottle. We can hear the gurgling faster and faster and higher and higher, like we're coming into the neck of the bottle. It goes blah, 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 and we're way up there somewhere, filling it up. He's going to come again. He's not going to tarry. He's going to do a quick work in the earth. We know that we are in the end time. God hasn't quit working. In the end time, the Bible said in evening time, there shall be light. This message will not wane. We're not going to die out. I know there's going to be a falling away, but in the evening time when the shadows should be falling, God's going to let this light shine just as brilliantly as though it were full noon time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Nehemiah said, I want to go back to Jerusalem. And Artaxerxes the king said, all right, something will have to be done. And so the story, to be shortened, was say that they went back and they did they got back and they said we got to build these walls up and get a defense we've got to build the temple again so we can worship God that's what we've got to do and so they started their little end time revival and they did fine for four chapters they did beautiful they built the walls and they worked the Bible said that Nehemiah worked with a trowel in one hand a sword in the other and I haven't come to what I'm going to preach yet I'm just giving you all the facts I'm going to give you figures in just a minute amen he worked, and they got the walls all started, and everything looked good, but they hadn't joined them together yet. And they didn't have the gates set up. They didn't have all the defenses fixed. And they had the foundation of the temple laid, but the temple was not finished. They had all of this started. And then comes the fifth chapter of Nehemiah, one of the most strangling and startling things that could ever happen. And this is what it was. The Bible says that a great cry came to the ears of Nehemiah, and this is what it said. There was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. You know why? Because the ones that hurried up and got back home from captivity first, they staked out their land and got their homesteads all fixed and got out their little plows and their mule and plowed up their ground and then sat down on the front porch in their rocking chair, and down the road comes another little family from Babylon. They've been gone for 70 years, too. Maybe those children were born captive. Do you know what they'd done to them in Babylon? They'd taken away the manhood of the boys. They had made the girls just court prostitutes for worship. They had ravaged them. They had torn them asunder. They took only the best of them, and the others they destroyed. You'd think they'd had their bellies full of that kind of stuff, wouldn't you think so? Wouldn't you think that 70 years in captivity under the heathen would have cured them all? No. They get back home and go to rocking in their rocking chair, and here comes a poor family down the road, says, we need a place to live. Said, go stay right over there. And so they stayed over there, and when it came time for the harvest, the old boy came out and said, I get half that corn. He said, what? I get half that corn, you're on my land. Oh, I thought we were brethren coming back from a strange land. I'm going to tell you a spirit that's in our churches, and it's in our world, and it's in the church, the body in general. And that's why I'm preaching it to the young people and everybody else that's here tonight. I want to preach to these young people that we exact usury, every one of our brother. We are living right now where God could pour out on us the greatest apostolic Holy Ghost renewal that has ever been known in the world. We've heard preaching on end time revival and we have spurted toward a zenith of excitement and glory only to get there and be frustrated by a continual and constant repression and reoccurrence of doubt, fear, unbelief, backsliding, and constant bickering and fighting. 
Now, you can sit up there and grin like a possum eating briars if you want to, but I'm going to tell you that in all of our churches, we feel that acceleration. Yeah! And we say, we're going to have revival. It's the will of God to have revival. And everybody says, Woo, hallelujah, that's the will of God to have revival. And it is. And it's right. And it just goes blasting ahead. And then just two or three weeks later, then we go, pow! And there's that terrible feeling ahead of us. That terrible wall we don't get over. I've come tonight to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you why we haven't plunged right on off into the revival that should sweep by thousands Americans out of these cities and out of the countrysides. And miracles should not be sporadic and now and then, but they should be constant in the ministry. They should be operations of the gifts of the Spirit that are constantly in operation and use in the churches. Why don't we see the widespread outpouring? We preach to our churches. We pray them through by fives and tens. We're going to pray them through by fifties and hundreds. We've said that now for a couple of years. We've been talking about this great outpouring and this great, we're going to build the walls again. We're going to lay the foundations again. You know what the problem is? You got it free, but you're charging everybody in the world a fee for the gospel God gave you. Spiritual user. It'd be bad enough to be a sinner in our cities and hope that our churches would find us. That'd be bad enough. I thank God I'm not a sinner in any city in this state or any state I know of because the chances of my being reached by a United Pentecostal Church saint and knocking at my door to help me would be almost nil. There's a rare chance I'd ever find the truth. I don't know, you're talking about miracles, I don't know how in God's name we all got here. You're going to have to listen to me a while now. I don't know how we made it. Most of us were born into it. Almost every young and sitting out here, your daddy or your mother or your grandma or your aunt or your uncle had it. That's how we got here. We are producing by birth and by prosperity and progenitory and apostolic church in the end time. That's not all God needs. What about the folks that were born Baptist and Lutherans and Methodists? Now, wouldn't that be a shame? I'm thankful for my heritage. I thank God that I was born into a Pentecostal home, but it's a very slight chance if I hadn't been that I had heard, have heard the gospel unless I had some kinfolks close by that had told me. You just as well to say amen to that. Preach it. Hallelujah. And this is what happened. Nehemiah listened to that a little while, and he said, Do you mean that in our country right back here where we're rebuilding this temple and where we're building our walls, do you mean our brethren are exacting usury? And do you know what? There was a great cry made. A bunch of those people came, brothers and sisters and friends. They were being charged the use of Canaan land by their own brothers and sisters. And they came to Nehemiah and Nehemiah shook his head and he called a council of the nobles together and he called a council of the elders together and when they all got together this is what he said he said this is not right didn't you get full of that over in Babylon didn't you get all of that you wanted in sin didn't you fuss and fight enough and talk about your neighbors enough and down everybody enough while you were a sinner do you mean now that you got back home and that God has graciously delivered you out of Babylon? You're going to come home and charge them to eat corn and charge your own brothers and sisters to live? They had done it so much until they were taking sons and daughters away from their brethren and making them servants because they could not pay the price to raise enough food to eat. And they were not doing it of sinners, they were doing it of their brothers and their sisters who got there just a little late. And Nehemiah said, I conferred with myself and I was angry and I said unto them, it is not right. Then I consulted with myself and I rebuked the nobles and all the elders and I said, ye exact usury every one of his brother. And I set a great assembly against them and I said unto them, we after our ability have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, which were sold into the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren, or shall ye be sold unto us? 
Then held they their peace and answered nothing. Also I said, it is not good that ye what you do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of God because of the reproach of the heathen our enemies? I likewise and my brethren and servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray you let us leave off this usury. Let's quit this. Business. Restore, I pray you, to them even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, their houses, and hundredth part of their money, their corn, their wine, the oil that ye exact of them. And they said, we will restore it. We will restore it. Let me tell you now, and I'm going to preach to you now. You ready? Do you know what? We preach against gossips in our churches. I'm, I'm preaching to you young people. You listening to me? We preach it's wrong to gossip. But we've got the keenest Pentecostal way of getting around that you've ever seen. Boy, we can say, now look, I'm not talking about them and just go run them right on down the pike. And tell them everything we think about them. And we don't say it to their face because when we see them, we grin real big and say, Praise the Lord, how are you? And then when we get off around the corner, they say, Boy, she sure is ugly. And we keep that trash up all the time. Come on now, look me right in the eye. It is the God's truth. It starts all the way up with me, the preacher. Look at me. Competitive, jealous, afraid to give honor to anyone else's spiritual accomplishment. Afraid if anybody else does something for God, it deteriorates me in the mind and the eyes of other men. We build us images we have to keep. <laughs> yeah, we've got to live up to it. We couldn't follow the Holy Ghost if we had to. We've got so many things that we've got to do to be who we are. Until the thing has spread its web all over us. We're eaten up with spiritual usury. Jesus hated it. In the New Testament, he said, you try your best to dig a splinter out of your brother's eye and you got a two before in your own eye. Yeah. Amen. You say, what's that got to do with usury? I'll tell you what it's got to do. Do you know what you're doing? You're charging us interest on a revival that we can't have until we get the unity of the Spirit. So, the man of God got up and started wandering around, and he wandered into town. When he got to Zarephath, there was a lady out picking up sticks. She was mighty skinny, as poor as a snake, and her little old wobbly boy laying over, over there beside the steps of the house with his knees all swelled up and his tummy bloated and his cheeks showing through the skin. And unless you have seen poverty and uh, really starvation, you wouldn't really know you wouldn't really know how hideous starvation can be in famine. I've been through some of the famine-infested countries where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and the wealthy and the uh, government agencies and all provide for their, for their cronies and for their own people who are pets in the government, provide them an adequate living, uh, and then the poorer people starve to death. I observed this in some of the countries in Asia where I was this past little trip. I uh, talked with one of the consulates from the, uh, un uh, from the United States uh, Embassy there, and he told me it's amazing how little of the money that America sends to foreign aid and to foreign countries really gets into the hand of the people. Most of it is gobbled up by the bureaucracy of those countries, taken by the government officials, stored for the rich, taken by those who are able to pay bribes, and he said the people of the country very rarely ever see anything that's sent from a richer country. That's a sad thing, but I'm sure it was true in this day. But this poor little lady had no connections. She had no strength to... Until every young'un in this camp has a heart that's as clean as the driven snow, you have no bitterness, there are no words, there is no malice, there is no carnality in your mind against them. You're not running them down. You don't chew them out. You don't have anything in your heart. That's not all. You say, well, I'm going to quit it. I'm, not, I'm going to get everything out of my heart. It's not just that. There's a spirit in us. Even if you don't say it, you think it. It shouldn't be in our minds. We should appreciate the operation of the Holy Ghost. We should thank God for every sermon that's preached. We should thank God for every song that's sung. We should thank God for every musician that plays, but it's not that way. The preacher preaches and automatically he goes on trial. Amen. 
And you say, now, you, what are you preaching this at youth camp for? Because I hope these young ones will learn better. A bunch of the rest of us hadn't. Because I'm going to tell you what, if we ever cured this Pentecostal usury we got going, the devil couldn't stop us with nothing. Nothing could stop the church if we quit fighting each other. Hallelujah! You know why we can't have revival? Because we hate each other. We don't love each other, preachers. I'm sorry, but we don't do it. And I'm telling all of them about it. I'm telling all of them we don't love each other. Because we've lied to them too long. And they're too smart for that. And you know what's ruined our young people? You know what shook me when I was a boy? You know what shook me? The inconsistency that I saw in Pentecost. It shook me till my teeth rattled. They said one thing and did something else. Lived a double standard. And all the young people wondered which one was right. Preach against jewelry and have it. Preach against wigs and wear it. Preach against short skirts and got them. I think it's time for all of us to understand that this is the day for us to get rid of all of this usury we've got going on. You know what I do? You say, well, how do you know all that? Because I'm part of that. I'm preaching to me. But I intend to preach that till I get tired. And I am not tired. Amen. There's a lot of devil spirits don't like what I'm saying tonight. Why don't you go home? You're bothering me. Because the devil knows if this apostolic Pentecostal church ever quits criticizing the ministry, ever quits criticizing the singers, ever quits criticizing the orchestra and the choir and the choir director, there are some folks hadn't heard nothing about miracles tonight. All they knew was the color of the dress of the choir director. Hallelujah. But you got it free, I want to tell you that. It didn't cost you a red dime. Somebody gave their sweat and their blood and their tears to love your soul. When you were as ungodly as a skunk. When God wouldn't have had you on a silver platter. Somebody dug you out of the mire. And told you you could repent and get right with God. Somebody loved your soul. Some dear old grandma with a knot on the back of her head. Or some dear old boy like old brother Miller. That you, he was six foot seven inches tall. He didn't have much sense, but he could pray in the altar till every dog died. And I remember when I was a kid praying for the Holy Ghost. They didn't leave me up there by myself. All the rest of the saints went back and talked about apple pie and went to the fellowship hall to eat hamburgers and french fries. But you could count on Brother Miller. Bless God, he laid there in travail over a seven-year-old kid until I looked at him one night and said, Brother Miller, don't cry over me. I'm just a boy. He looked me in the eye and he changed part of my life when he said, son, you are not just a boy. He said, the hand of God is on you and if I can help make you a man, then I will help to reach hundreds of people. He didn't charge me nothing. <laughs> he gave it away free. But you can't wait to get your hot dog while somebody lays up here between heaven and hell. It don't mean that much. It's just another youth camp. It's just a big gob of stuff up here. It's just humanity everywhere. Hairpins flying and white shoes are jumping. And that's all you've seen yet. But if you ever settle down and get money out of your eyes and food out of your eyes and start thinking about God's world like he thinks about it, you'll change your mind. I mean that usury shut down the apostolic revival in Nehemiah's day. It stopped the toe. Couldn't go anywhere else. Said the wall wasn't joined together yet. The gates hadn't been set up yet. The temple wasn't finished yet. What are we going to do? We're going to have to get rid of this usury. We'll never get it done. On the day of Pentecost, they were all in one place with one mind and one accord. 
The Bible says then in the fourth chapter that the place where they prayed together. And the Bible says every man that joined himself unto them was of one mind and one heart. And the place where they prayed together was shaken. Amen. The Bible said all the people gathered together to hear the apostles. And they all gave ear unto them. And even the shadow of Peter passing over them, they were healed. And we read that kind of spectacular, off-the-cuff miracle of power. And wonder how a shadow could heal them when ten preachers popping their hands on their head can't do nothing but get them weak and sit them in a bench. The difference is the unity of God's will and spirit in the mind of us all is the most powerful force the church will ever entail and use. And until we get it, we're going to see a miracle here and one over there. Five tonight and three next Sunday night. And maybe a splash in ten or twelve. Woo, ain't that wonderful. And then we might go a Sunday without anybody. And maybe two or three weeks without anybody. And we're going to do that just like we've done that. Because the walls are not set up and the devil can come rushing in on us. He comes right in, slips in, and gets some of your mothers and your daddies and some of you. And you can walk away from this youth camp with the glory and the power of God. But the wall's not built around this apostolic move yet. And the devil slipped right in on you. And in three days, you're so depressed, you don't know whether you're alive or dead. Some of you sitting back there combing your hair while I'm preaching. Popping bubble gum. You haven't got the Holy Ghost and fire like I've got it. You're charging me a price tonight to preach the gospel to you. Every time you dig your fingernails while your pastor preaches and sit around and pass notes, you're charging your brother and your sister the high cost of your carnality for them overlooking you to hear the gospel. Think about that. Sit around and act like a backslid hypocrite and don't think of nobody but yourself. And somebody sitting behind you had never been there before. I slipped in a church not long ago unannounced and unadvertised and sat down on the back bench. I was so shocked I couldn't hardly believe it. I slumped down on the bench and I managed somehow not to be seen. And that was just so, I was so excited and thrilled about that. And it wasn't very long until it all started around me. The bench right in front of me had a bunch of young'uns on it, about 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age. The boys had long hair down over their ears. The girls were sitting there. I tell you, they weren't clad. And it was just something going on. And they got to whispering and talking and laughing. Even until some of the adults in the church turned around and looked at them. And they just keep it up and kept it up and kept it up. And all of that carnal. And I thought, now, if I was a sinner and never had been here before, this is one church I'd never, ever go back to again. I would never go back to a Pentecostal church again. And I'd classify every Pentecostal church I heard of in that same category. They don't allow the Baptist to do that. The Methodists don't act like that. But us Pentecostals, yeah, we got it free. What I got to worry about. And if I don't got enough, I can go get some more if I feel like it. If I don't feel like it, you can't make me. And I'm not going to get my hair cut if I don't want to. And I'm going to tell you, you've got a rebellious devil in you as big as this tabernacle. And you're walking the razor edge of God's destruction. Because we're not in the same day we used to be in. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in Jesus' name. Nehemiah sat down in front of those nobles and he said we can't do this anymore I'm going to tell you what I hear do you mind if I tell you what I hear I heard an evangelist not long ago and a bunch of you fellows in the, in the Bible school and some of you are going to be evangelists and some of you are already evangelists and some of you are shaping your lives for the ministry let me tell you what I heard an evangelist say and he's not here tonight and he hadn't been around here and you wouldn't know probably who he was he said to me he said I'll be so glad, Brother Hammy, when I can get a church big as yours is. He said, really, that's been my goal in life. And I said, well, isn't that something? I declare. He said, you know, he said, I don't think I'll ever feel so good as when I can drive a big car and have a big church and preacher pat me on the back and quit calling me by my first name. There's a bunch, a bunch of us feel like that. We are measuring God's grace by what we can get out of it. I'm sure this ain't the place to mention it, but fighting for a church, putting our name in, trying our best, preachers, 
to get that bigger church, to get that bigger income, without a dime thought for the souls of men. <laughs> you have to excuse me, I'm sorry as I can be, but I'm going to tell you we'll eat up with it. We're charging the lost and charging our brothers. I can't let my brother preach right because I'm sitting down listening to whether his grammar's correct. And whether he built the bridge or built a fire. Or whether, and we sit back there and listen. I didn't like Brother Hammy tonight so good as I did the other night because the other night I felt, oh, I got so happy. And that's the way we think. Without one dear thought that God may be talking to us for an eternal value that we could never lose. Somewhere, somebody is going to do what Nehemiah did. He sat down in front of those nobles, and the Bible said, and in front of all the people of Israel. They had to quit revival. They had to quit rebuilding. They had to quit all of that, and they stopped it off. And he sat down and evidently had a garment, an apron or something on, and he started shaking that thing. And he shook that apron. And you know what he said? So may God shake every one of you out of Israel. If you do not leave off this usury. And you know what I bet you know when I got this little message? I was in Manila preaching, and that night I had watched God heal blind eyes, people who had never seen one woman who had been blind for over 40 years, born blind. She saw clearly for the first time in her life after 40 years. A baby, 16 months old, was born blind in her mother's in its mother's arms opened its eyes for the first time and saw the world and looked into that face. Crippled men. One man, 35 years of age, had never walked without a crutch. And when he was prayed for, he walked away. I mean, walked away. Sound and well and whole. I watched them, I watched them stack crutches under that platform. Canes. I watched those people parade by. Cripples. Blind. Those little kids, 12 years of age, 14, when you lay your hands on them, you hear their bones pop in their crippled legs. Pow! Bang! Just snapping. And they'd put their foot down for the first time and try it out like a toy and start walking on it. And I, I looked that all over and I thought, hey, that's great in Manila. And then you know what hit me? I almost crawled to my motel room. When they let me out of the truck, I said, somebody help me. One of you brethren help me. And they helped me, Brother Sism on one side. And Brother Nepp said on the other, they helped me to my room. You know what I saw? I saw America. American young people. You've got clothes. You've got shoes. You've got food. You've got everything from motorcycles to mascara on your eyes. You've got it all. Everything but the good love of God. Those poor little old folks... They'd come one night and get healed and couldn't come back not another night because they didn't have any bus fare and lived in a huge city of four million people. And they'd hold on to your hand and pull until I left two knit suits over there that I couldn't wear anymore because they'd pull the knit out of them. Holding on to my legs, I'd push them away when I prayed for them because God healed them. And, the, and they tried their very best to thank me for coming to preach to them. And I looked into the face of those people and crawled to my room. And finally, when I got to the door, I collapsed and crawled inside. And I said, my God, tell me, Lord God, why we're in America. We're the ones that send the money. We're the ones that got the finance. We got it first. We had the message first. And that's, and that's when it hit me. We got it first. And we're charging the whole living world our price to give them the gospel. Spiritual usury, it's got us dead. Our walls are not finished. The devil marches into our churches day after day. It destroys our young people. It puts bitterness in their heart. Never has there been a rash of rebellion among young women and young men like there is right now. There are some young campers right here at this camp meeting right now that won't even speak to your mother and your daddy. I know because you've talked to me about it. But you've got a car. And you've got the keys to it. And you got a girlfriend you won't give up. And you got everything else. Everything but a good, honest idea of where you got what you got. And I'm here to tell you one more time. You got it free. And you intend to charge not only yourself and everybody around here, but the whole wide world a high fee if they're ever going to get it. We got it first. And then I started praying for America. I'm sorry now, I, I know it's late. Y'all just sit down there just a while. You're all right. Yeah. 
An old song touched my mind. I used to wonder why they put it in the songbook. <laughs> America. I thought that was the stupidest song to put in the Pentecostal book I ever heard till I got back from overseas this last time. And I sat in that room and with my legs crossed and rocked back and forth in that room and sang, America, America, God shed His grace on thee. Yeah, but when the song leader gets up to sing, and then it all starts rolling in on me. And he picks the song, I say, well, I don't understand why he's singing that one. I want to sing, I'm on the stairway to heaven tonight. Instead of getting with it, whatever it is, just get with it and love God and say, let's go, let's go. No, we sit around, we become the filter for every sermon. We think we got the mind of God and the man that's prayed and studied all day don't know nothing. Special singer gets up and forgets what he's singing on the second verse and has to start the chorus over and we all snicker. My God, help us. He didn't meet our qualifications. He's going to have to pay a little before he breaks through my shell. He can give me a little of his corn tonight. He got up and did his best to give it to me free, but I'm going to charge him if he ever gets back my worship tonight. He's going to have to pay for it. He's going to have to do it right. Spiritual usury. We're eating up with it. That's why the devil can rush in and take us off. The Bible said, and if it, it scared me to death the other day when I read, the Bible said he takes us captive at his own will. Any time he gets ready, he marches in and takes us. We get into a depression. We fall into some kind of a tremor. Something happens to us spiritually. We don't have to live under that. We are given in the Bible a victorious salvation, a miraculous ministry, a glorious outreach for the gospel. This is not some kind of a humdrum. This is a power-packed, apostolic, thrilling, exciting message that should produce every time it's preached. This is not a now and then gospel. This is not a haphazard shot. This thing will work every time we put it out there, unless... When we plant, we plant to get some back. And when we give, we give to get some back. And when we love, we love to get some back. So that members in the church can't even speak to each other. Can't shake hands with some of the kids on the campground. Some preachers ignore each other. Not for any good reason at all. It just goes on and goes on and goes on and goes on and goes on like it will never stop. Like an avalanche that can't be stopped. It goes on and on and on until I have cried and cried and cried, my God, why can't I love everybody? Why can't everybody love me? Why can't we just be the children of God with our mistakes, with our faults, with our failures, as many as they are? How can I condemn you when I'm a human being? And you know why the devil don't like this? Because if we ever quit this usury, a charge on our brother for his love and ever quit all of this business and charging the preacher. I stood right out there. Now, I'm going to be playing with you just for a minute. I stood right out there, the last camp meeting, while a preacher preached his heart out. I couldn't get in the building. And I was so shocked to hear some of the young boys who came slipping out of the tent I was, or out of the tabernacle. I was glad they left. I wanted their seat. But when they slipped out, I heard one of them whisper to the other, Ah, he's lousy tonight. He's lousy tonight. Is that what you say about your pastor when he doesn't just ring the bell just right for you? He doesn't bring you to your feet and make you shout? Is that it? But you never feel a spiritual load? Never feel like getting down on the floor and crying with him? You ever feel like getting out of your seat while he was preaching and having a struggle and get on your knees and lay your face down on the bench in front of you and say, My God, speak to some heart tonight. Have you ever thought about giving away what God gave to you? Or are you going to charge everybody a fee for it? He gave it to you free. You got it free. I just wonder how we're giving it to the world. The reason why we hadn't reached the world is because we're charging them a price for something they ought to get free. Shall we stand?